Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your internet shop teacher, and I'm standing next to the little road 7 inch shaper, and it's already been sold, and it has not, of course, been picked up yet, but I thought I'd make a couple more videos before it is gone forever. And in this video, I'm just going to show you some assorted sundry shaper operations, no particular order or value to them, so let's begin. Some shapers have a vise that is keyed, and when you mount it, it will be truly be 90 degrees or 0 degrees or whatever you want to call it. But on this particular one, no, because this is a brown and sharp vise that didn't particularly come with this machine, 4 inch. But using, and I'm going to indicate it in, so using a little Sterrett back plunger indicator, and I think a back plunger is the best for this, but that's up to you. Now you ought to unplug the machine when you do this. You don't want it to come on and you want to be careful you don't break off the stem. But I've already got it in the approximate position and I'm going to lower it so it's against a clean fixed jaw, never the movable jaw. I will start by putting the indicator on zero and then I'm just going to run it across the full width of the jaws and you can see that I'm a full 10 or 15 thousandths off so I will loosen both sides but one side will still be kind of snug the other rather loose and then I can tap it into alignment alright the far side is semi loose this one's fairly loose and using a soft hammer and watch the indicator now. Wrong way, Corrigan. Now I brought it to zero, but did the other side move? So I need to move it all the way back and double check. Well, now it's within two thousandths, so that's pretty good. So I'll zero it out again, and you can work on either side of the vise. Then I'm going to bring it back over. I won't waste a lot of time on that, and tap it back to zero, and test it. You've got to test it over and over again, even after you tighten the bolts to make sure that that has not influenced it. All right, it's two minutes later, and it's just fine now. I didn't want to take the time because sometimes you'll have to fiddle around with it back and forth and back and forth in the next operation I'm going to feed down with it and machine the end of this piece that's in the vise so I want to make sure that the cutting head here is square with the vise with the work with the table so let's look at the little protractor over on the side so over on the side here there's a protractor and I do not like the little witness or zero mark. It almost seems to be homemade, but it, it's nothing more than a center punch mark. And right now it doesn't look like it's quite on it, but I want to show you a better way to check that. And in order to adjust it, we have to loosen this square headed bolt. So I'm going to check this with a high quality machinist square. Okay, I'm going to put a precision square right on the table here. Not the aluminum plate, not the vise, and that's clean. So is the, the machinist square, and there's just barely room in there for it to fit. And I'm going to bring it right up against the slide right here. Not the clapper box, because the clapper box is at this time uh, set at an angle. I'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to bring that right up against there. I'll reposition the camera and show that I'm not anywhere close to zero. Looking at it from the front view, can you see now that it's way out of square? It's much wider right here and it's touching right here. So loosening that square headed bolt that I just talked about just a little bit. I don't like to get them too loose because I like to use a plastic or a soft hammer to tap it into alignment right there 
and then tighten the bolt which I have a wrench on. Alright this is a piece of aluminum here and I have shaped the top of it some time, time ago. I don't think it was in a video but it's just a job that I did and now I want to square up the end so I want to talk before uh, I start on how I position the tool and the clapper box and all of that because nobody addresses very much uh, the positioning of the clapper box. There is no power vertical feed on these smaller shapers so I will be feeding down with uh, this and it's very hard to feed uniformly and get a good finish so I'm going to tell you right now it won't be a good finish but we're not too worried about that for this demonstration also I want to tell you that I should feed down that is the, that's the uh, advancement for each cut only when the tool is going backwards or is in that position that's not always possible to do when the machine is running uh, fast because it's really moving back and forth like well like this so you have to kind of time yourself and if we had automatic feed it would do that you watch uh, a bombs videos and you'll see that now note the position of the tool it's choked up there's not very much tool sticking out of the tool holder there is not very much tool holder sticking out of the tool post there is not very much of, uh, of the entire slide uh, sticking past the, the dovetail in other words you want everything as rigid as possible now look at the clapper box and the angle that it's set at it's not in the vertical position and why is that? I'm going to uh, close, uh, give you a close-up and, and demonstrate what is happening. So on the return stroke, if the clapper box moves and it may be imperceptible, it is moving away from the work. Let me zoom in on that. And here's what I'm trying to explain if it makes any sense and this is just a 5 thousandths feeler gauge and I brought the tool up so it's it's actually dragging a little bit I, I can feel this feeler gauge drag now watch what happens as the clapper box moves out or is in the clapping position I guess you could say see how it moves away and I can almost get an, a piece of eighth inch stock in there now as it comes up see that and then when I let loose it falls down to where again it's five thousandths away did anyone ever explain that to you question mark again never turn the machine on until you have turned it with the hand wheel to make sure everything is clear I've already set the length of the stroke and the position of the stroke and the speed of the stroke and that's all shown in other videos so moving the tool up just a little bit like that and then down I told you I'm five thousandths away from the work but I'm not sure the end of the work is square anyway so now I will raise the slide up and I'm going to feed with the hand feed here, oh, let's take off 10,000. No, let's take off, I don't know, 12, 15, 18, 20 thousandths. Because I'm only going to take one pass here. The power feed is in the neutral position. All the feeding will be done with my hand right here. And again, I'm trying to advance it when the tool is back, but my timing will not always be that good. I'm feeding down right now, and there are the first chips. And yes, this is labor-intensive and uh, <laughs> rather tedious, I must say. So I may not even complete the full cut, but let me zoom in on that just a little bit.
And the finish is fair, nothing to write home about. Again, it is inconsistent when you are hand feeding, unless you really concentrate on it and work at it. There may be times when you want an angle on the end, so I'm going to leave the exact same setup and the exact same piece of work in the vise, and I'm going to loosen the slide and turn it arbitrarily five degrees. And I'm just using that inexact little index mark. It could be set with a protractor or it could be set with a layout line. There's countless ways to do this. So you can see I'm approximately five degrees. At least good enough for this demonstration. All right, this will be a trial cut. I'm not sure how much I want to take off to start with. Perhaps 25 thousandths. And then back up for another pass, feeding in here. I'm going to go a full quarter turn, which is 25 thousandths. Now that was a roughing cut. So it is very rough. It needs one more pass, and that would be my finished pass. I'm not going to do that because you get the idea. And now we have, I have, a five degree angle on the end. Now this is free of charge, but the same operation could have been performed by putting the work on a five degree or however many degree angle block that you wanted in other words, turn it this way, the work would be held like this at the correct angle and then you could feed straight down. You still wouldn't have a power feed, but you would not have to set your tool slide at an angle. You may wish to machine a flat on a shaft and that can be done just by placing the work in the vise and I'm on a parallel to raise it up. Tighten the vise and go ahead and machine it to the length and the depth that is required, or it could be held in a V block. I'm not going to do that because it's such a simple job and it's not unlike just machining a flat. But there are times when you may want to uh, put a square or a hex on the end of round stock, and in that case, hold it in a collet block like this. There's a square collet block. And here is a hexagon collet block if you wanted to put a hex on the round stock. So let's turn this into a square, just about half inch back. And that's already tightened. All right, take a look at the setup. Now I've already changed the length of the stroke. So it's only about five eighths or three quarters. So we don't waste a lot of time. I've got a mark there as far as the length is concerned and I only put the mark on the top side because each time I rotate this, and this will be four cuts, I want to position the collet block in exactly the same position, in other words a stop and there would be more accurate ways of doing this but here's an easy way. Each time I rotate the collet block 90 degrees I'll just use a little piece of square stock here and butt it up against that and this is against the two jaws so that will always give me the same position. And notice that the slide is back in the zero position and the clapper box is pretty much in the neutral position. I've touched off the tool to the work and now looking up here I am going to zero out the little graduated collar because I'm going to feed a total of 100 thousandths deep on each of the four sides, not all in one pass of course. I'm not sure that will bring it into full square, but it will serve the purposes for this demonstration to show you how to square up some stock. Now as far as the length of the travel is concerned, you can go to a layout line, but I've only got the layout line on one side. 
or and this is a bit of overkill but I've got that steroid indicator set here so that it will zero out when I'm on the blue line just an idea okay 25 thousandths depth of cut And I'm using power feed. That's not much of a cut for my first bath, is it? And another twenty-five thousandths. Okay, I'm at 100, or at the zero here, and I have decided that 85 thousandths is all that I need in order to get a true square. So I will rotate it to the next side. And this is side two. Tighten it up. Can you see the clapper box moving? Okay, and this will be the last side. And this is the very last pass. You know what, that dial indicator really worked great. Now I'm going to take the dial indicator and the vise off and show you one last operation. Okay, I took the vise off and then slid this off and you can see that it's held on with T-nuts and cap screws. And I haven't had that off in since I uh, bought the machine really. Alright, now there's different ways of holding work. It, they can do work, larger work can be clamped directly to the table through the use of clamps and the T-slots, not unlike what you do on a milling machine. Work could be clamped or bolted to this side because we know that, well we're assuming that this is square with the top, but I'm going to use the other side. On this side there are also holes and there is a v-groove. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to take a piece of scrap stock and uh, hold it, clamp it into the v-block, into the v-way, and that could be a real long piece too, whatever would fit down here, or much larger in diameter or, or larger than you could fit in a vise. Well, I made these strap clamps and they're just held on with bolts. The heads are on the inside. These are not threaded holes. And I made two of them, but I think I only need one. And it could be larger material like this also. Or whatever size fits in here. And why are we doing it this way? That also could have been done in the vise in a manner of what I showed you a little bit earlier. However, here we will be able to use power feed, so I would say that's the advantage of doing it off to the side. So let me get that set up and let's do some cutting. Well, this setup requires me to move the table over as far as I can. I hope I have the reach for it. And also I have to raise the table quite a bit. And this is how I do it. Well, you know what? I'm really at the capacity of the machine. I cannot quite get the tool to come out that far without really fighting it. 
So I'm going to put the 7 8 stock in there instead of the inch and a half or whatever that is. And you can see that if you come over to the end here, I'm really at totally at the end of the travel here. Okay, that's a lot better with the smaller stock. After all, it's a small machine. And the strap is bent just a little bit. I should have used heavier material, but if it does work its way down, I would put a clamp of some kind down here just to support it on the bottom so it can't get pushed down. I've also changed the length and position of the stroke so it's all ready to cut. And yes, this is really a job for a lathe where we could face that off in a matter of 30 seconds and I've spent almost 30 minutes with this setup. But I'm just trying to show you different ways. Perhaps some people do not have a lathe. Also I had to put the tool holder at a bit of an angle and then change the tool around so you know it would it would fit so there it really was a reach for this but before you turn the switch make sure you roll the hand wheel make sure everything clears and you got the position that you want and you're not going to crash the machine when you turn it on so right now I'll bring it down basically until I touch off and then move back and start the cut always with a small amount and a trial cut even though it tends to waste time I, I know that all right the trial cut pretty much started to square it off and I'm not going to take it down enough to where that center hole is gone this is a 25 thousandths depth of cut a 4 thousandths feed and that's really all that we'll do on this piece Alright, that's as far as I'm going to take it, but you can see that does a nice job of squaring up or facing your material. Now as I conclude this video, I'd just like to say that there are many different uh, items of tooling and fixtures and so on that could be used on any machine. This is a little rotary table, and actually this is an Atlas brand, and was designed to go on the little Atlas shaper, which is the same size as this. So if this was bolted down to the T-slots, you could mount your work on here, and uh, take a cut, or whatever the operation has to be, and then rotate it. There's a protractor along here. You could put a small dividing head on here, but it would have to be quite small, or a spin index. But just a lot of different ways of setting up your work for different jobs. It's all up to your own imagination and creativity. I hope you enjoyed this video. It ran way longer than what I thought, but it's just a little bit of an introduction to small shapers. There's one more video to follow, and that will be safety on the shapers. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now, and I'll see you next time, I hope. Work safely, always.